Hello, this is Camille Fairborn from Utah State University, and I'd like to welcome you to today's cause teaching and learning webinar. We're pleased to have as our presenter today Dr. Nicholas Horton, who is a professor of statistics at Amherst College. For today's webinar, he will give a presentation entitled Teaching the Past, Present, and Future of Statistics. The way the webinars work is that all listeners are muted during the webinar. You can ask questions at any time by typing them into the questions box. We'll be sure to ask those questions either as they come up or towards the end and give our presenter a chance to respond. You can also use the chat box if you're having any technical issues or questions. At this point, I'll turn things over to Dr. Horton. Nick, go ahead. Great. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this activity that I've incorporated into my theoretical statistics class. And I want to really start with a wait, wait, first give you a little bit of introduction to COPS. COPS is the president. It's a committee of the presidents of statistical societies, uh, ASA, ENAR, IMS, SSC, and WENAR, that has the goal of working on shared problems and improving so inter society communication. So, in addition to their work on uh, the five awards that are given out at the JSM, it's also been involved in other projects over the years, including publication of uh, what I call the COPS book to commemorate the 50th anniversary of COPS. So, the COPS Past, Present, and Future book. Um, was published in 2014 and it contains 52 short chapters that are contributed by past winners of one of the COPS awards. And the goal of the book um, was to showcase the breadth and vibrancy of statistics, to describe current challenges and new opportunities, to highlight the exciting future of statistical science, and to provide guidance for future generations of statisticians. And I should note that the book, while it's lovely in a printed edition sold by CRC Press, is available as a freely downloadable PDF from the COPS.org website. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to be describing how this book and the chapters within it were integrated into a theoretical statistics course with the goal of helping students to see the big picture and potential for statistics. So you have here just a picture of the, the top of the cover with some of the COPS um, awardees and their, uh, who authored chapters. The bottom, Shi Hong Lin, the former chair of COPS, was the primary editor of this along with some other uh, collaborators. Um, and you know, there's a nice review of this if you're trying to get a big picture for the, for the book as a whole from Ron Wasserstein who said that 50 great thinkers about statistics provide the reader of the COPS book with reminiscences to learn from, technical questions to tackle, and challenges that inspire. He describes the book as exploring the present vibrancy and vitality across a range of topics that reflect the vast diversity of statistical practice, that it has multiple perspectives that present foundational issues at the heart of statistical science, and then there's parts that are really very valuable for those new to the profession. And he, he highlights uh, the whole women thing by Nancy Reed and Louise Ryan's reflection as, on diversity as kind of bigger questions that are inspirational. Closes by saying that for those new to the profession, the COPS book presents an entire section that's advice for the next generation. And this book, along with the London Workshop Report, that's included in Ron's review, provide a great view of the panorama of statistical science, past, present, and future. And this is really what led me to kind of be bringing this into my course because I want to have those bigger issues and bigger questions is included in as part of their material. So what I did was to incorporate an assignment in a course, and here's part one of the statement of the assignment. This was a low stakes assignment that was included as part of my undergraduate uh, theoretical statistics course. I have about 20 students, but I could imagine this work being done in a larger course where there were individual sections and the discussions could happen during those sections. The learning goals of my course include an explicit focus on com computation. This is something that I've uh, argued uh, that is really critical for this course to reinforce aspects of computation and develop empirical and analytic problem solving that can really dovetail with each other. And also the important of, importance of reinforcing communication, which was a key part of the ASA's guidelines for undergraduate statistics programs. So the instructions said that each student will be giving individual short presentations on a chapter of their choice from this book. They should submit a list of their top three choices, and I gave a deadline. This happened about this uh, the, the uh, fifth week of the semester, sixth week of the semester. 
And I told them they couldn't pick chapter 14 as I was going to be presenting on that. I wanted to give them an example of what such a presentation would, would take place. So there was some work they did in advance of the class to pick their chapter and prepare their assignments, but the presentations were done pretty much in one 80-minute class period. So to give you a sense of, of how the book looked from the student perspective, you know, they were scanning the table of contents. And they he saw here, you know, chapter 12 was a uh, chapter on promoting equity. Steve Feinberg, the late Steve Feinberg, uh, statistics and service to the nation. You know, Peter Hall talking about living in exciting times. Rafa with the bright future of applied statistics. Um, some great advice things, you know, Terry Speeds never asked for or give advice, make mistakes, expect mediocrity and twos. And then 13 rules for giving a really bad talk by Brad Efron, kind of closing, closing out the book. So the students had their choice of 51 chapters to be able to, to present. So then once they'd picked those chapters, I gave them more explicit instructions about what they needed to do during their uh, presentation. And so these are going to be taking place about two weeks later. And the instructions were to be lightning talks. They're only three minutes in length. Um, and they in, were intended to give a glimpse of what's in the chapter. They also needed to aim them at students in the class to keep track of their audience. It wasn't aimed at me. That they needed to have a compelling opening. Um, and I told them I would read the chapter title and name of the author, but they needed to kind of start uh, with something that actually got the people's attention. They just needed to describe why you picked that chapter, one thing you learned, and pose a question that you have that wasn't answered. So these kind of this rubric of trying to think about a three-minute talk that would have kind of a punch to it. So I gave a presentation on chapter 14. I like this chapter for a couple of reasons. One, it's the shortest chapter in the book. There's only a couple of uh, pages, and it really focuses directly on aspects of the undergraduate statistics of a major. So Ian Johnston put this together. And so now I want to kind of jump into a little bit of a kind of a play within a play by giving you the mini presentation that I gave my students. So again, chapter 14, Nick will be talking about Ian Johnston's Where Are the Majors? The following figure suggests in the United States the field of statistics is spectacularly and u uniquely unsuccessful in producing bachelor's graduates. And compared to all of the disciplines with AP exams and doctoral students, statistics is dramatically underrepresented. Ian Johnston describes this as a, either a spur to action or maybe it's just an irrelevant curiosity. But let's take a pic pic look at the picture that's being referred to here. On the x-axis, we have the bachelor's to AP ratio. So here, if you're one on this log scale note, that the number of bachelor's graduates relative to the ratio of number of AP students. So we see that for psychology, for example, it's, it's about the same number of graduating psychology majors as those who took the AP um, exam four or five years earlier. Um, similarly, we have a bachelor's to PhD ratio, which is for about, you know, for every 19 or so bachelor's PA, BAs, there's actually one PhD in uh, psychology. So we can kind of see that there's a kind of variability within each of these, and art is a little bit of an outlier, that there's more than 50 or 60 um, art mat bachelors for every PhD. But what's really interesting here is how far out in the realm, in the, in the outliers, statistics is, both in its bachelor to AP ratio and bachelor to PhD. And this was the main kind of thing that Ian Johnston wanted people to be thinking about. The solution that he talks about was to kind of be thinking about re re revising our undergraduate programs and to kind of help to train holistic statisticians who are nimble problem solvers, that, that, that there's a need for general problem solving skills to make use of data, and that there's this concern that many graduates don't have sufficient skills to be effective in the modern workforce. Um, we brought in this idea that Thomas Lumley stated that our students know how to deal as n goes to infinity but can't deal with a million observations. And if statistics is the science of learning that from data, then our students need to be able to think with data. And my question for Ian would be, how should we fix these problems? And that really kind of gave him this sense of just how different statistics was. So as I kind of close, go back to the webinar, end of the play within a play, um, I wanted to kind of just think about this idea of bringing short talks into the classroom, that the students have really rehearsed those. It's very straightforward to rehearse a three-minute talk five or six times. It doesn't take that long. To think about which chapters the students picked, how were the presentations, and what kind of feedback was available from them. So 
this semester my students choices um, hit a number of the chapters again with 20 students and and 51 chapters there's there's you know some uh, potential for them to kind of be having them all unique turns out there was some overlap certain topics were were very popular I had to go back to some students whose first three choices have been selected by someone who submitted earlier but you can see that there's a number of these ones going through the earlier chapters which are kind of you know often life stories uh, aspects of kind of thinking about big picture for statistics and then moving to the later part of the book where there is more of a a kind of aspect of, of this, you know, kind of career advice for, for students. So the feedbacks on the presentations tended to be fairly positive, um, that the students tended to enjoy these. I don't have actual data uh, from them, but just in terms of their anecdotal uh, approach and engagement with the presentations. But we also had a visitor from the Teaching and Learning Center, and that person came and actually gave some more specific uh, feedback. Um, what they said was, given on this slide, you know, I love the way that the students came out from behind the podium to be closer to the PowerPoint and still managed to speak to the audience versus the screen and it kind of gave this a, a, a yay. And again, this has been, there's other opportunities in this course. Um, I, I'll give a pointer to it. Um, uh, I gave a pointer to it a little bit earlier, but this course features a uh, modified more method approach um, where students are actually describing solutions to problems they've been working in groups. So they've had a fair amount of practice in the course in terms of the presentations, but nothing really this type of expository uh, talks. Uh, so and so did a great job beginning their presentation with a question for the audience and using their answer to continue the talk. Excellent. And again, this is another area where in the first part of the semester, the students would really start off with, with so or something. Um, as a way of kind of get started, but to think about what that starting point would be, what that, you know, equivalent if it was a TED talk, how that might be beginning in a way to kind of capture the audience's attention. Uh, the, you know, Teaching and Learning Center staff member said she was energized after she left the classroom, both by the presentations and the content. She did admit that much of the content went over her head, but in general the students were able to kind of distill a big picture that could fit within a three-minute lightning talk. But there was lots of areas where there could be some improvement uh, for that. Students can continue to improve by working on the unwanted up-speak habit, uh, making more consistent eye contact with the audience versus the computer screen, arguing that rehearsals will solve this. And again, as I've noted, that it's possible to rehearse these very quickly many times. And practicing the art of beginning each sentence with the word that starts the sentence. And as someone who is guilty of using filler words uh, in their work, um, I, there we go, I'm just now thinking, and there's filler words coming out um, all over the place, to really be thinking about focusing and practicing uh, the pacing to ensure that, that, uh, that the presentation really is compelling. So my goal here was to just describe what I think is a really neat reference book. And if, if, if all you get out of this webinar is that this book is freely available for you to download and is a great thing for any statistics educator or statistician to be able to get a sense of the broader things that are going on in statistics, then I think I'm going to be successful. But I also think it's really important for us to think about how to communicate the excitement of statistics for our students. And this, I think, provides an opportunity to bring that in in a way that doesn't require a whole lot of effort on the faculty members part that the assessments relatively straightforward and provide students a chance to kind of practice and improve their communication skills um, while bringing in these interesting topics what's interesting from this book is that I found in mean, a couple times I've done this is that some chapters chapters are more accessible than others it's a challenge I think for someone like Shi Hong Lin and the editors to go to these people who won the Fisher Award, won the President's Award, E.L. Scott, um, uh, F.N. David, or Snedeker Award, and then kind of say, well, that's not exactly what we want, and could you make this a little bit more accessible in some fashion? Um, so they've actually found some of these chapters to be really difficult to kind of get the big picture and to, to summarize. Occasionally, I'll let them switch chapters if they've run into issues and problems, but I think it's also good for them to kind of get a sense of this and really to kind of be hearing a lot of other short talks about another, another, uh, other topics. And in my, in my experience, it does help them to get more perspective 
about the diversity and potential of the broader world of statistics. So again, that was my goal, was to kind of give you a brief sense of how this was structured and organized uh, with the encouragement to be thinking about utilizing this approach or similar approaches in your theoretical statistics course or other upper level courses within your curriculum. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, um, we have a quite a long time. If anyone has some questions they'd like to ask, uh, go ahead, please, and type them into the questions box. Um, this was a really interesting uh, presentation, Nick, and I'm interested in, I guess, your students, how they improved over the semester in terms of their communication and if they are starting to see science communication as part of their job as scientists or statisticians. Did you get that sense in talking to them? So um, uh, communication has really, I think, been an important part of how we've been structuring the statistics major at, at Amherst. Our introductory statistics courses all feature a project where students give an oral presentation as part of their group effort. Um, they need to create a handout with a front and back that has the kind of key analyses and take-home messages for that. So they really do get some practice with that. I've put together some things uh, for that introductory course where uh, there's an activity called Pick a Blog where people have to pick a statistics or software R or SAS related blog entry and give a 90 second lightning talk about what was, why they picked it, and how that proceeded. So even in the introductory course, they're starting to get some practice with these. Those skills get reinforced in their later courses. Um, our second course, which is a, a data science course, or a regression and design of an uh, experiments course, that both have group projects within them with presentations. And then the structure of the theoretical statistics course, so they get multiple times where they're practicing things. And even though, you know, it seemed fairly straightforward to be asking questions of who is your audience, how does your handout support what you're doing, the practice and, and you know, it's, it, there's always a tendency for them to kind of say, oh, I'm not going to refine that in various ways. When we have visiting speakers from Google or other places come in and talk about what's the most challenging part of their jobs, they will describe this aspect of communication. They have one shot to their manager to communicate what they've been doing and to really kind of make, help that make sense in the right ways. And that communication part is, if it's short-changed, they're not going to be able to get, get the work done that they need to be doing. And I think the students hear that and having these multiple opportunities for practice um, really does allow them to kind of benefit by, you know, developing the technical skills, but also this ability to communicate them. Because without that communication component, um, they're not going to be effective. Um, that's great. Uh, we've got a couple of questions, one from Eric Reyes. He says, other than timing, what is the benefit, in your opinion, to a lightning talk versus a longer presentation? So I guess the, um, uh, the challenge for me of a longer presentation, and as I said, we do do those, um, though I've, made, I've tended to make them shorter over the years in terms of end of semester cumulative you know, group projects. Um, I think what you can do in a 10 to 12 minute talk, which is what we typically do for our end of semester, for me to be doing that even in our relatively small class sizes of 20, 20 to 25 to 30 students would require, would require multiple class sessions to be doing longer talks. By having it be three minutes, what really happens is it takes about four minutes between talks, and so I can do about 20 or so of these in one class period. Um, I think it's challenging for people, uh, um, particularly those under the age of 25 whose brains are still developing, to sit still for presentations for more than a, you know, an hour, an hour and a half. And so keeping them short, I think, has great potential to allow there to be more lower stakes uh, ways of bringing in these types of things as opposed to you know, a group presentation where, again, they may only get the same amount of time if there's three people in a group and they're giving a 10-minute presentation. So for me, having the lightning talks lets me do this without displacing other contact hour activities that we might be doing. So kind of to go along with that then, um, Jennifer Green says, thank you for sharing this. How did you assess the presentations and would you recommend that same approach to others? 
So I provided the students um, with feedback, um, and uh, it was a relatively kind of um, um, straightforward, kind of like check plus, check, check minus type of assessment with specific feedback uh, that I took notes as I was proceeding through their through their talks. So I would give them comments on whether or not their slides uh, really supported their presentation. I looked directly at the, their opening and whether it was a kind of a compelling opening. Um, I provided some feedback to them about filler words, posture, other aspects, pacing. Uh, but it was a relatively straightforward kind of, you know, if they did a reasonable job, it was a check. If they did an exceptional job, it would be a check plus. So very low stakes, like you said. And then Carolyn Cuff wants to know if you've used other books in other classes or if you have any other recommendations that way. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I've not used other books in other classes, but I do think that there are... Um, um, I've, so I've done other things in different classes, and in both the regret in in both the regression course I mentioned and our capstone course, I've had students identify images in science or nature within the last two years. So they have to the assignment is to identify a graphical display, send me the PDF of that and a kind of page number for where it shows up, of a display they find very compelling, and a display they don't find they find not so compelling. And so for each class, then I will get a set of uh, N good, good visual displays and N not so good visual displays. And I will have them give a kind of a brief 45 to 60 second explanation of why they found that particular image compelling or not compelling. I have collated all those things. I can just be presenting the image on the board and having them uh, on the screen and then having them present and, and talk about that. So I think there's, there's other ways in the same way I mentioned that pick a blog. Um, where um, you know it does allow there to be big, bigger things brought into place, and there's some judgment about how to how to be proceeding. And then one more question: Have you thought about using peer feedback for the marking of it as well? Yeah, so I I've had a mixed experience with peer feedback. I used to um, uh, rely fairly heavily on it, not for this, but for end of semester group projects. Um, I found um, that it was the way I was collecting the data, which was on little pieces of paper, required a fair amount of data entry on my part, and that the information content was not particularly high. Um, I kept on doing that for a while because I did find it, it, it helped to engage the students to some extent, but I really wasn't finding um, the, the rubric and form that I put together. It might be, uh, to be particularly helpful, I, it might be useful if I had kind of a shorter, um, like single numerical scale and one comment. Um, uh, I've sometimes asked students in that guide, what is the big take home message for something? In the same way that I do that with my end of class, one minute essay um, mm -hmm. types, of, types of things. But uh, I've not been, um, using that as much part, partly because I found that there was great uh, ceiling effects for the students rating themselves um, and uh, wasn't getting a lot of information back from, from that. Well, and then I just have one more question about uh, something you mentioned. You said you had someone from your teaching and learning center come to class and I've never actually thought about that. Is that something you do often? Because I think most of us have access to some sort of of teaching and learning center. How, can you explain maybe how you interact with them? So, so um, uh, we do have a very active teaching and learning center and they've recently brought someone on with a focus on on public speaking um, and that person does does workshops and works with faculty in various ways. Um, that's been very helpful for me because I've, I've done some experimentation with public speaking and presentations and as a way of trying to bring in more communication into the curriculum for statistics students. Um, and it was very valuable and uh, to have them just come to class one day um, and to kind of be thinking about how to be putting together better assignments and to structure things. Um, I think we have similar, many people will have similar people on the writing center side who can help with writing a prompt or kind of putting together writing because written communication is also part, uh, an important part of communication. Um, 
but it's been very helpful to be partnering with these with these people who do have expertise that complements my own in terms of um, how how to teach public speaking, how to teach communication that complements my background in statistics and computation. All right, and then let's just do one more question. Eric wants to know why you chose this book over having students present on a traditional theory topic, for example, an e uh, the EM algorithm that you maybe didn't cover in the course. So uh, one of the great things is um, I do I do cover the um, uh, EM algorithm um, in the course, and there's there's some nice uh, material. I've been using Rice's mathematical statistics and data analysis and bringing in some supplementary supplementary things. Um, I think part of the reason I use this book is that it's free, that it's relatively new, that it's um, it's the leaders in statistics that. Um, are part of the world that the students will be will be going out to those particularly heading into into graduate school um, because my course has this explicit communication component to it where they're presenting solutions to challenging problems um, from race um, with these empirical analytic and and and, and empirical solutions um, I, there's less need for me to have them be doing those kind of presentations. Um, I have done um, similar things in some other ways where in the same course at the end of the semester I will have them in groups of two present on a paper from the American statistician and that has kind of had a little bit more of a technical uh, detail. Those are more like eight minute presentations to kind of give a summary of, of an article and um, those have been helpful for, again, to kind of be thinking about more technical. So I don't think this would preclude doing that in some ways, but this does allow you to be bringing in some of these bigger questions. So I have a pointer to the uh, modified Moore method, and again, there's some discussion and a listing of other um, papers and articles that talk about communication and the importance of it in terms of the undergraduate curriculum at the second link. And I believe the, the, the slides will be posted soon. The slides are actually already posted, so you're, everyone's welcome to go and look at those and get these references. Well, thank you again, Nick, for presenting this for us today. And just by way of announcement, I believe we are planning to have another webinar on July 11th, this time with someone from data.world who will be talking about uh, that new resources that we have available for both teaching and our own uh, data analysis. So that's coming up and uh, again thank you all for coming. Thanks Nick. Thanks.